So as an introduction, as a motivation for to deal with renewable energies, I have, uh, so to say, the aim and the goal to, to convince you that climate change can only be solved by renewable energies and climate change is told to be the biggest challenge of mankind, bottleneck for the civilization, the Everest of all problems. Urge, it's urgent and it's immediately and you can find information about the climate situation of our planet everywhere. And um, I have chosen to, to collect a kind of a catastrophe panorama and uh, uh, not, not to drive you to suicide, but to, to tell you how, how important it is to use the diagnosis of climate change and to know the therapy, namely the complete change into renewable energies. Let's see, I hope that my presentation really works now. Now, when you, when you look into the most recent publications of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you find sentences like this, recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, intensifying and unprecedented in thousands of years, unless there are immediate rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. That's it. It is undisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, drafts more frequent and severe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Hope you have, you have you know all these uh, all these informations already. And to limit global warming, strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases are necessary. This would not only reduce the consequence of climate change, but also improve air quality. And you already recognize it has something to do with us. It's not only a matter of, um, let's say, economic economic uh, circumstances, but it has to do with our health. And uh, it has to do with the health of the planet. And uh, if the planet is healthy, then we are healthy as well. Now, now, if you look into the details, look into the information you can get, you find, for example, there's a significant increase over the last um, 150 years, and here are the, are the last 60, 62 years, and you see on the on the right side, it's from the May 22, so it's the most recent data about CO2 concentration in our atmosphere, it's from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, and you see it's increasing, 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 you have this, um, this year, annual change um, from May to October, and May it's a, it has the highest value, and in, in October, it has the lowest value because the biosphere is, uh, is simply collecting some of the, of the carbon from the atmosphere. And, but it, nevertheless, you see it's increasing and you hear are the most recent data, so to say, and uh, you find it, it, we are increasing and we are emitting CO2 all the time. Now, if you look into um, the, the forces affecting the global temperature, then over the last, I would say, 50 or 60 years, there were a number of skeptical, uh, of skeptical movements, so to say, to say, well, is it really true that there is a kind of climate change? Is it, or if it is, is it really anthropogenic? So are the humans the reason for the climate change, for the global warming? And here you find um, on, a, on a Fahrenheit um, scale, you find the natural forces, so the solar variations, for example, the variations of the solar luminosity, you find the volcanoes, et cetera, et cetera. And then on top of that in the blue line, the human forces, and you see the observed global warming is a gray scale. And uh, you see that the human forces are the ones who drive it. And it just, just for, for completeness, if you want really to know who or what is, in, uh, is responsible for the, for the enhancement of the CO2 in our atmosphere, you have to do isotope um, analysis of the C, the carbon isotopes in the atmosphere tell you that it's the carbon coming from the fossil resources and the fossil resources were made during the last 300 million years and the fossil resources and in their origin, they came from photosynthesis. So in photosynthesis is, uh, is um, using more C12 than C13 just for the for the experts uh, listening to that, and then you can find that uh, in the last 220 years, the, the concentration of C13, so it, it says uh, the carbon 13, which means six protons, of course, so it's carbon, and but it has seven neutrons instead of six neutrons, and this re uh, concentration is reducing, and you can find it automatically that only the humans are responsible for the enhancement of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's it, so there is no doubt about it, never. So if you look into the, into the uh, prognosis for the, for the climate, 
uh, over the next, uh, let's say, 100, uh, or now in this case, even uh, 80 years only, um, then you will find that it's depending a lot on how much uh, the drive is we are using with the atmosphere. In other words, how much our atmosphere will enhance the radiation uh, of, the, of the sun. On the left side, you see 2.6. This means 2.6 watt per square meter more than normal. On the right side, you see our 8.5, 8.5 watt per square meter more, and you see the big difference. So in, indeed, actually, we are on a, on a um, scenario just in between. It will become much, much hotter uh, on, on the uh, Arctic and Antarctic part. We will um, find, um, I will show you more details about that, but this is, so to say, the future for the next 74 years, if we don't do anything, is on the right side. If we would be very, very, very good, this is on the left side. Actually, we are in between. Now, if you look for the temperature anomalies of the last 150 years, you find that there is a global warming all over the continents since at least 50 years. And since 50 years, we find warming everywhere on our planet. Not only, not only in certain regions, but it's everywhere. So it's really, a, so to say, a pandemic of warming everywhere. It's not epidemic on scales, on the local scales, it's pandemic. And um, this is, uh, you, can, you can have it here in the 50, 42 years, which is the data source is Berkeley Earth Daily, and you find it uh, on, the, on the ground. So you can see that the land is warming up and you see the temperature scale here. In some cases, uh, especially in the north, the south, it's plus three degrees Celsius. So it's far above the 1.5 degree uh, goal of the uh, of the Paris Conference. We are already enhancing our temperatures much much higher, especially on land. And what's even more disturbing is that uh, there are lots of fires all everywhere. And this is carbon monoxide distribution in the in August uh, in 2019. And you 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 see the sources for the carbon monoxide, namely the big fires everywhere. And um, this is already a kind of um, let's change uh, the Earth age from Anthropocene to Pyroxene. So this is the age where we will have, or we have more and more fires everywhere. And uh, of course, this is kind of dust material which falls down onto, for example, glaciers and ice uh, is uh, then enhancing the uh, capabilities of the Arctic and Antarctic regions. To, to absorb more and more heat, which means that uh, the ice is melting and I'll come to that point later. Now, what is even more disturbing is that uh, over the last 150 years, we observe more and more that our oceans everywhere are also warming up. And this is a disaster because the reaction time of the big uh, amount of water on our planet is, of course, much, much longer than the reaction time of land to warming up. We can identify the warming on land practically immediately, whereas the Atlantic Ocean or the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, when they heat up, this will take a long, long time to cool them down again. This will take 100, 200 years. So what we see here is already the reaction of the oceans to the increase of the carbon dioxide from the 19th century on. This is already something we are now, now um, <clears throat> analyzing. And it's becoming, of course, a big problem because warm water needs more space. And so it's a sea level rise. It's not only because there are glaciers on the, on, the, on the solid ground, which are melting, but also because the water becomes warmer and warmer. Now, you, we, can see, we, we can see the melting of glaciers, uh, for example, on land here, the uh, Greenland ice mass changes over the last uh, 20 years. We can observe with an interesting satellite rays, which is normally measuring the deviations from uh, from our gravity, from our planet. So when, when the ice mass over the land changes, then the land is, of course, uh, speeding up, or uh, light lifting up, so to say. And this lifting up means that the, that the gravity of our planet changes locally, and we can measure that. So it's an interesting combination of astronomy and uh, climate forces and climate uh, science. So you can see here how uh, the Greenland ice mass changes. You can see here how the Atlantic, the Antarctic ice mass changes, and this is a disaster for all kinds of uh, for all kinds of um, scenarios. What will happen? What will happen with the uh, with the uh, <clears throat> with the sea level? 
Of course, you can imagine, and this is from a, I don't, I don't know the actual the source. Here's what the Earth would look like if all the ice melted. Maybe this is more motivation than any kind of uh, scientific data is to think about if all the ice would melt, then the Earth's uh, sea level, uh, the sea level would be globally enhanced by 60 meters, let's say. And then you can see here in that in that uh, animation what we, that, that all the cities you you, you see the, the the names from they will vanish and you look Denmark will vanish parts of Sweden will vanish parts of the United Kingdom Netherlands parts of Belgium will vanish Venice will be away Barcelona will be underwater etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, so 60 meters means a lot so parts of Western Africa are then uh, in away and there's some um, parts of, uh, of North Africa and et cetera. You, you can imagine that, well, what would it mean for Pakistan, for India, for Bangladesh, for example, a disaster for Thailand, for the Far East, everywhere on the coast will be a disaster. So there's a lot of need, I think, to, to go and, and to solve that problem. I will skip that. And just telling you that um, the rising seas are one of the most dramatic consequences of global warming. And uh, it will enhance and enhance and enhance. And you see here uh, that from the, from the year 2000 to 2100, on we have 52 centimeters, 85 centimeters. So, for example, this is 85 centimeters is a high warming scenario in which we are actually. This is our scenario here where we where we go through. I hope you can see my my uh, my small arrow, white arrow here. This is a scenario we are going through, actually. The sea level rise would involve 1.4 billion people until 2060, uh, because there are so many cities on the coastline, so, 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 so many people live on the coastline that uh, this is only for Asia here, and this is already, uh, it will be a disastrous future. Now, on, on top of all that, of all the, so to say, the, the isolated, the isolated uh, effects and the isolated consequences, there is this big risk of having something uh, that it's a kind of a tipping. So that means that all these different uh, uh, dangers we have, all the different risks we have will, um, so to say, add to a collective risks, namely that there is an irreversible change of our world into a uh, hot earth. Well, you, you, of course, know many of these, many of these tipping points, the permafrost problem, the Arctic Sea, the albedo, uh, dramatic, so that also the Arctic Sea is in the water, so when it melts, there is no sea level rise, but uh, when the Arctic Sea ice melts, then you lose white, you lose white, white areas, and white areas mean that um, there is no more reflection, but instead is absorption of heat, so from the white ice, it's becoming dark water, and dark water is absorbing a lot of heat. The same is true in the oceans, of course, and on the other end, you, you can find diff different, uh, uh, different uh, tipping points like methane uh, coming from the permafrost, uh, methane class rates, but also the Amazon rainforest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and when they all go together, then this can be an absolute disaster for the near future. And so that is what, what was uh, in 2016 for the first time, for the first time in, in, in science, in the scientific analysis, it was uh, termed the hothouse earth, namely when you, when you look at the time scale here that our earth were more, was more or less in such a kind of an interesting dynamical um, equilibrium between glacial and interglacial cycles. And this was in the Holocene, but since the since humans have made more and more influence on the natural processes and networks, the Earth became on a on a on a path which is too strong onto a way up to hothouse Earth. So we have to stabilize under our stewardship. We have to stabilize our Earth system into an Earth which is again in the glacial and interglacial limit cycle. And that is the reason why we have to reduce CO2, and this is the reason why we have to go into into renewable energies. So the risk of multiple interacting tipping points should encourage rapid CO2 emission because this is a, this is a danger we can no longer rule out. And uh, we don't even know how far, how strong it is uh, or how, how close we are to this, to this tipping point scenario. Big main global warming dangers, the Arctic feedbacks, as I said, the agricultural failure, the ocean acidification with ocean warming, because the oceans have to, to absorb more and more CO2, they will become more acid, and they become warmer and warmer, which will, is a disaster for the life cycles there. The so deaths and injuries, infectious tropical diseases, extreme weather events, heat waves, drafts, floods, etc. So human health is directly involved 
in all this. Um, and um, I think this is the most the most problematic uh, news from uh, from the from science is the number of days is, uh, per year above deadly threshold. That means that we can will no longer uh, guarantee that everybody can live everywhere and every place in the world. And when you look here at the different and the different scenarios again, these are these climate scenarios where the numbers tell you the, the increase of the radiation effect by the enhancement of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, 2.6 watt per square meter, 4.5 watt per square meter. This is actually the scenario we are going to if we will not do more and more or not move more and more into renewable energy that the world we are going to face in about 60 to 70 years. And the RCP 8.5 scenario is a business as usual and now we will not even change from coal or oil to some renewables. So you see the number of days above that is threshold. These are very hot days where you no longer can cool your own body against the heat and the humidity outside. That means that there are large, large, large areas in the world where nobody can live anymore. So our fragile, uh, I, I think that we have uh, said a lot and enough about um, the reasons why you should go into renewable energies, uh, deal with renewable energies, because that's a question of our centuries. This will be the question for the next two centuries, but we have to do it now because otherwise all these risks you can find on the, on the uh, um, PowerPoint transparency here is uh, what will happen. And uh, this is not a, not a future not for the adults, not for the children, not for our grandchildren and not for the unborn. So we have to do it and we have to do it fast. Otherwise, all these different problems will be on the red, red light and there will be no green part anymore. So three years to safeguard our climate was set some years ago. So maybe uh, we are now five years later. We are now in 2022. Maybe we have a few years more, but it's not a thing which we can leave to the next generation. We have to do it now. We have to do it fast, efficient, and uh, as, as good as we can. Thank you.